book, which was 1980, this problem was still unknown. Nobody knows how to do it. Nobody knows whether it's undecidable. And I don't know, and I don't think that there's been any resolution of this. So nobody knows. If you figure it out, and assuming it hasn't been solved in the last few years, you will be famous. What if these two are finite state machines? Is it decidable or undecidable? Decidable, because you minimize them and you test them for identicalness and you're done. So DCFLs are kind of in this funny never-never land of, of, of right in between finite state machines and context-free languages and have some of the decidable properties of each. Not terrible in the realm of being able to work with them, but still not as nice as finite state machines. And this equals not true for, for the same reason you have to check every possible string that can be generated in the language. There's no way to compare the machines. That, uh, right, I don't want to say that, that that's why it's undecidable. That's not why it's undecidable. That's why, that's a justification for why I believe it's undecidable. Because any way I try to do it seems to run forever. Right, how would we try to do this? We'd, we'd try to take every single string and check them for membership in each of these languages and hope that the membership answers match. You know, that yes goes with yes and no goes with no. And if we ever get a mismatch, we'd stop and we'd say these languages aren't the same. But if the languages are the same, we'll never know it. But I might also think there's some way to compare the machines. Oh, yeah, right. Grammar. And in fact, people do think that for deterministic context-free languages because nobody knows. So there's some proof that's a Oh, yeah, no, I'm going to prove to you that you can't do this. Okay. Yeah, we're in 10 minutes. We're going to, every one of these is all undecidable. I'm going to convince you. And it's not going to be some weird, twisted, who knows what's going on proof. It's going to be very straightforward and very constructive. As long as you believe that this is impossible to do, I'm going to convince you that all of these things are impossible to do. And it's through this idea of a reduction. All right, questions? So let's, let's do it. Let's do some of them, at least. Okay, what's a good one to start with? How about, uh, we'll start with this one. We'll start with trying to find out whether the intersection of any two context-free languages has something in common. Here's what I'm going to try to convince you. Follow this logic and then I'll get into the details. I'm going to try to convince you that if you went home and you had a way to determine this, whether two given context-free languages had something in common, yes or no, if you had a way to do that, then I'm going to show you how to use your method to solve this problem. And we know we can't solve this problem. It's impossible. So if you have some hypothetical method, and I can show you how to use that method to solve this problem, that means you don't have any hypothetical method. It means you're lying. Right? So I'm going to show you exactly that. I'm going to show you that if you had a method, how could you use it to solve this problem? And because of that connection between the solution to this problem implying the solution to this problem, it means this problem is undecidable. What this means technically is that we are reducing the PCP problem to this, we'll call it empty intersection problem. Intuitively, I'm showing you that the empty intersection problem is at least as hard as the PCP problem because if you could solve the empty intersection problem, I will give you a way of solving the PCP problem. And since PCP is undecidable, and this is harder, or at least as hard as undecidable, then you're in pretty bad shape. So how am I going to connect the PCP solution to being able to solve this problem? This takes a little bit of a, of a leap. And once you see it, it'll make a lot of sense. It's not, like I said, it's not way out in the middle of nowhere. So here's what we're going to do. Somebody's got a PCP problem. Let's pick one. How about this one? As good as any. Somebody gives me a PCP problem. I'm dying to solve it. I know somebody who's got an algorithm for this. So here's what I do. I'm going to take my PCP problem. I'm going to fiddle with it to come up with two grammars. I'm going to give it to my friend who's got an algorithm for this. 
And if they tell me the, the answer to this is yes, I'm going to know the answer to the PCP problem. If they tell me the answer to this is no, I'll know the answer to the PCP problem. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my PCP input, I'm going to fiddle with it, create two grammars, and hand it to this person, and let them do their work. And I'm going to convince you there's a relationship between the answers. OK, questions about that process. That process is called a reduction. You've seen it before in other ways, in algorithms, but now we're doing it here with grammar. Here's the grammar I'm going to come up with from this example. Looks like this. Look at this grammar for a minute and get used to it. What kind of things does this grammar generate? It's a grammar that comes from the A column of my input. What does it generate? Are the little letters terminals or non-terminals? The little, small letters are always terminals. Uh, so the A, B's, and C's are terminals. What kind of things does this generate? The, it, it, it's got bunches of ones and zeros followed by collections of A, B's, and C's, right? The ones and zeros represent concatenations of these strings, right? And the A, B's, and C's represent kind of a record of which strings were concatenated. For example, if you, say, if you see an A, the first thing right after the ones and zeros, that means the very last sequence of one and zeros was one from, was this one? If you see a B, it means its matching sequence was a 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. It's a way of remembering the order of the strings and how I generated them. For example, 2, 1, 1, 3. Let's actually do this one. 2, 1, 1, 3. We end up getting uh, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Then there's two ones, so it's 1, 1. And then there's a 3, it's a 1, 0. What does the right side look like? The A, Bs, and Cs that get generated by this grammar if we concatenate 2, 1, 1, and then 3. C, A, A, B. OK? I can match these up. Here's the C. That's the last production I, substitution I made. Here's the A. Here's the A. And here's the B. That's the kind of things this grammar generates. Concatenations of these strings and keeping a record of how, where they came from. This is like the sequence, the 3112. It keeps it in reverse because it's, it's all nested. Questions about that? If you get that, fine. If you're wondering where we're going with it, you'll find out in two minutes. But just make sure that makes sense. Because we're going to do the same thing now with B. <coughs> so this looks like 111 uh, SBA. One zero S B B and zero S B C. Same kind of grammar. Now let me ask you a question. Can S B generate that string? Right. Erica told us how. S B can generate this string by starting off with what production? Starting off with 2, with the second production, and then doing this twice, 1, 1, and then doing this, 3. And you get the exact same sequence. This would match up because we checked that it matched up before. And the CAAB would match up showing that we actually did. What does that guarantee? That guarantees that we picked these in pairs like we're supposed to. If we made these grammars without the C's and the A's and the B's, then getting a match wouldn't imply that we solved the post-correspondence problem. It would imply just that we mix these any way we wanted. So we want to make sure that we pair these up right. All right, well, fine. So this generates strings, and this generates strings. If these two generate the same string, 
it implies that there's a solution to the post-correspondence problem. I can just use this sequence. 